okay, so let me just review a little bit and then I'll just go over some of the homework problems. Um, infinite limits and asymptotes. So a nice example is a function like f of x equals three over x minus two, which is defined for all x except where the denominator would be zero, that is for all x different from two. And if you graph this function, at x equal two, there's a problem, it's not defined. When x is equal to three, for example, it's equal to three. And as you get closer and closer to two from the right, this denominator is going to zero, so this fraction is going to infinity. On the other hand, as you go out to plus infinity, the denominator is going to zero. So the function is decaying to zero. To the left of this vertical line, x equal two, for example, when x is zero, the value of the function is minus three halves. When x is one, the value of the function is minus three. When x is minus one, the value of the function is minus one. If x is less than two, <coughs> the denominator is negative, so this value is always less than zero, so you're under the x-axis. As you approach two from the left, this is negative and going to zero, so you're going to minus infinity. And as you go out to minus infinity, this denominator is getting, is going to minus infinity, so this is approaching zero. So this is what the graph of this function looks like. And if you look at this function, we would say the following, the limit of this function f of x, as x goes to infinity is zero. The limit of the function f of x as x goes to minus infinity is also zero. <clears throat> what about the limit as x approaches two? Well, it depends whether you approach two from the right or from the left. If you approach two from the right, that's the one-sided limit. X approaches two, I'll write a plus sign there. <clears throat> that means X approaching two through, through values greater than two. Function is going up like this. This is going to plus infinity. But the limit of F of X as X approaches two from the left for values less than two you're going to minus infinity. So these are what we would call infinite limits. It's a limit from the right or the left or both, which is plus or minus infinity. These are what are called asymptotes. As you go to plus or minus infinity, as x goes to plus or minus infinity, the function has a limit. In both cases, it's zero. So as you're approaching plus or minus infinity, the graph of the function is, as we say, asymptotically approaching the x-axis, the line y equals zero. So these are very, very, very nice examples. And if you are fortunate enough to be using Maple in your Math 155 class. Let's see what I can do with that. Um, here's my Maple worksheet. And if I were to plot this function, I 
3 over x minus 2. That's what it looks like. So you see this vertical line, x equal 2, that's, that gives you the two limits as x approaches plus or minus 2. They're infinite limits. And as you see, as you go out, let me even go out further. Yeah. As you go out further and further to the left or the right, the graph of the function gets closer and closer to zero. Very hard to tell it apart. In fact, if you were to graph this function, even let's say from 20 to 40, this is the function. And it's hard to see the difference between that and zero. Anyway, um, for this course, you don't need to do maple. But if you are using Maple and Math 155, this is really uh, a great tool for calculus. Okay. Any questions about this? So let's give the formal definition. So if we have a function f of x, define for all x in some interval, except possibly at x equal to some number c, what does it mean to say the limit of f of x as x approaches c is infinite? It means as you approach C from the right or the left, once you're close enough to C, if I take any number, no matter M, no matter how big, the graph of the function is above M. So to say this means that for all numbers M bigger than zero, there exists some delta greater than zero, such that when you're within delta of the number C, C plus delta, C minus delta. So whenever X minus C is less than delta in absolute value and greater than zero, we don't need to let X equal C. So such that if X satisfies this, then f of x is bigger than m. That's exactly what it means. And we also have infinite limits from, from the right. That means this is c. We don't look at any c's, any values of x to the left of c. We only look for at x greater than c. That means that the same condition is satisfied if x is greater than c and less than c plus delta, or x minus c is greater than zero and less than delta. From some point on, you're above m. That's from the right. And from the left, it would be exactly similar. Here's C, here's some big number M. There's some delta such that for any X between C minus delta and X, the graph of the function is bigger than M. So this is for X less than C and greater than C minus delta. <clears throat> or in other words, X minus C is less than zero and greater than minus delta. In any case, when you look at the book, you'll see very good pictures and clearly written and so forth. That's what you need to know. So 
This is, you know, the definition of an infinite limit. And the places where you have an infinite limit are called vertical asymptotes. So we say that the vertical line, x equals c, this is the line x equals c, is a vertical asymptote of the function f of x if the limit of f of x as x approaches c is either plus infinity or minus infinity. And one case where you always have a vertical asymptote is if, if you have a quotient h of x, which is f of x divided by g of x. And f of c, the numerator is different from zero, but g of c is equal to zero, then then there is a vertical asymptote <clears throat> at the line x equals c. And there are lots of nice examples of this. For example, here are some that are given in the text. If you have the function f of x equals one over two times x plus one, this is a quotient, the numerator is one, the denominator is two times x plus one. This is defined for x different from minus one. And <clears throat> you graph this function, This is minus one graph of the function. Looks like this. And this is the line x equal minus one. That's the vertical asymptote. Let's look at another example. Suppose we have the function <clears throat> f of x equals x squared plus one over x squared minus one. So x squared plus one is never zero, it's always at least one, but the denominator factors into x minus one times x plus one. So this function is only defined for x not equal to plus or minus one. So this is the line x equal one. This is the line x equal minus one. And we would expect vertical asymptotes at these two lines. This function has two vertical asymptotes. And if you graph it, <coughs> See, when x is zero, you get minus one. For x between zero and one, this is negative. It's always below the x-axis. And as x approaches plus or minus one, from the inside, this is negative and going to zero, this function is gonna have a look like that. It's gonna be the case that the limit of this function f of x, as x approaches one from the left, is minus infinity. The limit of f of x as x approaches minus one from the right is minus infinity. What about the limit of f of x as x approaches one from the right? So when x is bigger than one, this is always positive. So it's positive and the denominator is going to zero. Zero. The limit of f of x as x approaches one 
minus one from the left, minus one, something is bigger in absolute value than one, this is positive. So positive, and this is going to infinity. So that's what the graph of this function looks like. And there are two vertical asymptotes. at x equal one and minus one. And there's one horizontal asymptote. That's just the x-axis, the line y equals zero. The function is approaching zero as you go to plus infinity or minus infinity. Any questions about this? Again, there's a lecture on YouTube covering this and these problem sessions are really for doing problems. And I'll do a few of the homework problems just to get a flavor of what's going on. So in section 2.5, number one, we have the function f of x is one over x minus four. And we want to determine, so when x is equal to four, this is not defined. And x is going to go to plus or minus infinity as you get close, f of x will go to plus or minus infinity as you get closer and closer to x equal four. Um, but what is it? Plus infinity or minus infinity? So of course, if you look at the graph, this is the line x equal four. If x is bigger than four, then x minus four is positive. So that means that one over x minus four is positive. And if x is bigger than four and x approaches four, that means the limit of f of x as x goes to four from the right is going to be plus infinity. But if x is less than four, then x minus four is negative. So one over a negative number is negative and you're going to be going, this is negative and going to zero. So you're going to minus infinity. The limit of f of x as x approaches four from the left is minus infinity. So the graph of the function looks like that. Problem three is the same problem, but instead of the function one over x minus four, it's one over x minus four squared. Again, this is defined for x different from four, but for x different from four, x minus four can be positive or negative, it's not zero, but when you square it, it's always positive. So one over x minus four squared is greater than zero. So the function is positive, the denominator is going to zero. So you're going to plus infinity. So for this function f of x, as x approaches four from the right, or as x approaches four from the left, that's plus infinity. 
And of course, if you have the same limit from the right or the left, you just say the limit of f of x as x goes to four exists and equals infinity. Any questions about any of this? Let's look at number 15. The problem is to find the vertical asymptotes, if any. So the limit, so here f of x is equal to x squared over x squared minus four. Well, when is the denominator equal to zero? If you factor this, this is x minus two times x plus two. So this function is defined for all x except plus or minus two. And If x squared is less than four, then x squared minus four is negative and f of x, which is positive over the negative, is negative. x squared less than four is the same as saying that x is between minus two and plus two. So minus two, zero, two, when x is between plus and minus two, this is negative, this is a negative number. When x is zero, it's minus four. When x is plus or minus one, it's one over minus, when x is one, this is one over minus a third. Oh, sorry, when x is, yeah, when x is zero, this is zero. When x is one, this is one over three, minus one over three, that's a third. And as x gets closer and closer to two or minus two from inside this strip, the function is going to minus infinity. So the limit of f of x, as x approaches two from the left, or the limit of f of x, as x approaches minus two from the right is minus infinity. If x squared is greater than four, then x squared minus four is positive and f of x is always positive. And as x, so what does it say to mean x squared is greater than four? That's the same as either x is greater than two or x is less than minus two. You're either out here or you're out here. And the function is positive in both those places. As x approaches two from the right or as x approaches two from the left, this function is going to plus infinity. So we have these two vertical asymptotes at plus two and minus two. Problem number 31. This is the function f of x equals one over e to the x minus one. The only problem would be when the denominator is zero. 
e to the x minus one is zero, that just means e to the x is equal to one. Graph of e to the x looks like one. The only time e to the x equals one is when x is equal to zero. This is the graph of y equals e to the x. Now, if x is greater than zero, e to the x is greater than one, e to the x minus one is greater than zero. So one over e to the x minus one is greater than zero. What does it mean to say e to the x, uh, sorry, e to the x is greater than one? Um, yeah, e to the x equals one, just that x equals zero. So when x is bigger than zero, e to the x is greater than one. So the limit of this function, one over e to the x minus one, as x approaches zero from the right, this is positive going to zero, the limit is plus infinity. When x is less than zero, e to the x minus one is negative. x less than zero implies e to the x minus one is less than zero, and one over a negative number is less than zero. So the limit of one over e to the x minus one as x approaches zero from the left, this is negative, the denominator is going to zero from the negative side. This is minus infinity. So this function does have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero, but looks like that. As you approach zero, you go to plus infinity from the right and minus infinity from the left. So, these are uh, difficult problems in the beginning. So you really need to spend some time and look at this and try to figure out what's going on. Here's number 33, tangent of pi x, that's my function. So I'll give you a minute and try to figure out where were the vertical asymptotes of this function? Remember, tangent of pi x, tangent is sine over cosine. So that's pi sine of pi x over cosine of pi x. So, the only time the denominator is zero is when cosine pi x is zero. So you have to know when that is. So can anyone give me an answer, a partial answer at least to this question? 
Where does this function have vertical asymptotes? When is the cosine of pi x equal to zero? For example, when x is zero, what is the cosine of pi x? Zero. Well, what's the cosine of zero? One. One. So it's not zero. So again, when is the cosine of pi of x equal to zero? What's the cosine of pi? Negative one. Negative one. What's the cosine of minus pi? What's the cosine of minus pi? Is it also negative one? Negative one. What's the cosine of two pi? Is it negative two? No, cosine's always between plus one and minus one. It's never negative oh, two. So is it negative one still? No. It repeats. Cosine of two pi is plus one. What's the cosine of pi over two? Is it zero? Yep. What's the cosine of three pi over two? Zero. Yeah. What about minus pi over two? It's also zero. Yeah. So the graph of the cosine, it repeats with period two pi. It just oscillates like that. And the cosine of pi x is zero. Sorry. Um, I should have said this is one half, one, two. Right, three halves. This is cosine of pi x. Minus one, minus a half, a half, one, three halves. Two and so on. Cosine of pi x is zero when x is a half plus any integer. A half, three halves, five halves, minus a half. That's when the cosine of pi x is equal to zero. What does the graph of the sine of pi x look like? So the sine of zero times pi is sine, sine of any integer multiple of pi is zero. And The graph of the sine looks like that. This is the graph of y equals sine of pi x. This is the graph of y equals cosine of pi x. So let's just look at this point one half. 
here's my function. What is the limit of the tangent of pi x as x approaches a half? That's the limit of sine pi x over cosine pi x as x approaches a half. Now, as x approaches a half, the sine is positive always but the cosine is positive to the left and negative to the right. So this is going to go to plus or minus infinity, but it depends which side you approach one half from. If you approach one half from the left, minus, the sine is positive, the cosine is positive. This is a positive number and the denominator is going to zero. This limit will be plus infinity. But if you take the limit of the tangent of pi x as x approaches one half from the right, the sine again is positive, cosine is negative. So this is going to be a negative number, the denominator going to zero and absolute value goes to minus infinity. So knowing the basic simplest properties like the graph of the sine, the cosine, the tangent, this is pre-calculus, this you have to know. And if you need to review it, then you have to go back and review it. Uh, so this is a very nice problem from that point of view. It kind of forces you to review some trigonometry, the properties of sine, cosine, and tangent. And if you look at the behavior at three halves, where there's also going to be a vertical asymptote because the denominator is going to zero, you have to decide whether you approach from the right or the left, whether you get a vertical asymptote, whether you go to plus infinity or minus infinity. Let me do just a couple more problems and, and then I'm going to stop and ask their questions. So this is number 45. Find the limit if it exists, the limit of the function x over x minus two as x approaches two from the right. So as X approaches two from the right, that means X is bigger than two. So X minus two is positive. So X over X minus two is positive. But the numerator is approaching two, the denominator is going to zero. So this limit is infinity. Any questions about this? This is, again, this is, you need to spend a lot of time trying to understand this stuff because it's, it's complicated. Number 47, the limit as X goes to one from the right for the function X squared over X minus one squared. And again, if X is not equal to one, whether it's from the right or the left, X minus one, squared, square is always positive. So x squared over x minus one squared is greater than zero. As x goes to one, this is approaching like one over zero, which is plus infinity.
Let me do, there are a couple of problems in the assignment for lesson six, which are actually from the previous section 2.4. And let me just look at a couple of them. Number 49, for these problems, <clears throat> You want to find where a certain function is not continuous. And if it's not continuous somewhere, uh, is the discontinuity removable? So problem 49, we have the function f of x is x over x squared plus 1. This is continuous everywhere. Continuous for all x. So, because x squared plus one is always positive. For all x. So, perfectly nice function. Problem 51, this may be more interesting. Let's see, f of x is the function x plus 2 over x squared minus 3x minus 10. And you can check, for example, if you plug in negative. See, when x is negative 2, the numerator is 0. If you put negative 2 into the denominator, you get 4 plus 6 is 10. You get 0 in the denominator, too. That's kind of complicated. but you have to know high school algebra, this denominator factors. You can write that as x plus two times x minus five. So this function is defined for x not equal to minus two or five. So it's discontinuous at x equal minus two and five. But when x is different from negative 2, I can cancel these. This is 1 over x minus 5. And this function is continuous at minus 2. So for this function, x equal negative 2 is a removable discontinuity. If I define the function f of x to be equal to x, equal to this, for x different from minus 2 and 5, and equal to this is equal to 1 over minus 7 when x equals negative 2, equal to minus 1 seventh at x equal to negative 2. I remove the discontinuity, but there's no way to define this function. So I have a content, so the function continuous at x equal five. So x equal five is not a removable discontinuity. Let me just do one more because these are kind of fun. Let's look at number 57 in section 2.4. We have the function f of x defined in two ways, depending on the value of x. It's a half x plus one for x less than or equal to two and three minus x for x greater than two. So here's the line x equal two. When x is bigger than two, this is the function three minus x. 
It's this line for x bigger than two. When x is less than or equal to two, it's the line a half x plus one. So if you have this line until you get to two, then it jumps. So this has a discontinuity at x equal two. The function looks like this, then it jumps down. And this function, there's no way to define the function at two, which makes this continuous. So this is not removable. So actually, I just went over almost all the homework problems for this section. Um, but your job is to do them yourself and to really understand all the reasoning that's involved in this. Uh, that's the complicated thing. So, all right. So again, I just remind you that lectures of, for the whole semester were, are already posted on YouTube. Um, I'll post this problem session as well, but, um, and if you have questions that come up, um, before our next problem session on Monday, I have an office hour on Zoom today at 7 p.m., and I'll also have one on Friday that I will send out, I'll post on the Blackboard. Okay. Any questions about this? Good, bad, indifferent? If not, then we will end for the morning. Uh, everyone stay well. Bye.